No, I was Good afternoon. Let's get started. Next week, we do not have a speaker. Rather, we have a very special event that we hold every semester. It's known as the Energy Open House, where we just come in and have a casual interaction about energy teaching, energy research on campus and uh, outside. We have, we have more than cookies and coffee. We bring in pizza and other stuff, uh, soda. So, you know, come in, bring your friends, and, and hang out for an hour to discuss energy. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Kiran Lakaraju, who is a senior member of technical staff at the Sandia National Labs. Kiran has a background in computer science. He got his master's and PhD degree from the University of Illinois. He is, specializes in artificial intelligence, multi-system models, and computational social science. What he does is he really builds models to understand propagation and change in attitude and behavior. For example, applications in propagation of information, propagation of linguistic behavior, changes in attitude for climate change, uh, and what we'll talk about today is adoption of energy technologies, but, but from a very computational, uh, heavy multi-agent system uh, perspective. Uh, more recently, he has been building models to explore linkage between social structures and cognitive structures. Uh, so, for example, how does attitude change propagate? Uh, how does information pro propagate? But, but within the context of uh, the interlinks between social structures and cognitive structures, he has also done some very exciting work on large-scale online social experimental uh, systems. So we really look forward to hearing what Dr. Lakaraju has to share with us. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> So um, thank you, Professor, uh, Professor Ray, for inviting me and having me at this, uh, at this uh, symposium. So I'm really happy to be here and uh, tell you a little bit about uh, this project. Uh, this is a project that is co-PI'd by me. Uh, I'm from Sandia National Labs and Eugene Vorobachek, uh, who is at Vanderbilt University. So um, the title is Promoting Solar Technology Diffusion Through Data-Driven Behavior Modeling. And I'm going to focus on a couple things. Uh, Data-driven behavior modeling are the key words here. Um, so that will come up over and over again. So let me start by telling you a little bit about Sandia. Uh, so Sandia's uh, been around since the Manhattan Project. And uh, initially, we were a, and we still are, a weapons engineering lab, nuclear weapons and helping with that. But we are also a Department of Energy lab. And we have a history of energy programs. Uh, we've done lots of work with looking at, for instance, uh, solar panels um, and studying how solar panels degrade over time. We actually have a lab where we can study that. Uh, we've looked at combustion. Um, we've looked at actually climate studies and how that Im can impact you know, uncertainties to economies. So uh, we've been doing a lot of stuff with a variety of uh, energy-related issues. And in fact, in, the, uh, in our energy program, one of our area goals is to develop advanced technologies and systems that will enable renewable energy penetration to grow uh, significantly. Now, Sandia, and most likely you've heard a little bit about Sandia, um, is an engineering lab. We really focus and we understand a lot of engineering problems. So why am I talking about human behavior? Uh, why is that an important aspect of uh, energy systems, and in particular, solar panels um, and PV adoption. So the reason I'm talking about it is that behavior, human behavior, underpins a lot of things within the power systems, within power systems. We all know about uh, demand modeling, about how, how we use electricity um, can influence the uh, choices that utilities make over time in terms of infrastructure and transmission lines and whatnot. But even at a, at a smaller scale, there's this great story of uh, TV pickups in the UK. So uh, in the UK, there's uh, several TV channels, uh, but there are some shows that seem to get a lot more attention than others, naturally. Uh, I think one of these is EastEnders. Uh, it's a soap opera. It turns out that a lot of people watch EastEnders, 
and they really like it. And at the end of the show, uh, they all get up, go to the stove, and put the kettle on and turn on their stove. So what does that mean? That means there's a sudden surge in electricity use, electric stoves, electricity use right then at the end of EastEnders. And you see this, uh, in this article, you see this picture of a, a grid operator with a little TV on the side waiting for the show to end so he can see to make sure to put in the necessary uh, resources to make, it, uh, to make electricity available then. And I like that example because, one, it's not just about uh, you know, transmission lines, what resources you have. It's about culture. It's about what people do after watching a show. It's about the popularity of TV shows. These things are seemingly uh, human behavior and have nothing to do with energy systems. But in fact, they are tied. Human behavior is tied to energy systems in many ways. We also know that humans are the ones that purchase energy efficiency products. LED bulbs, photo uh, solar panels, uh, Tesla cars, things like that. So there's a purchasing aspect as well. How can humans be uh, persuaded to purchase or give them enough incentives to purchase? Also, human operators run the grid. Um, I've got a picture here uh, of one of the Vermont Utility Corporation's control room. Uh, so that's where people are sitting there and they're monitoring it 24 hours a day to make sure that nothing uh, bad is happening. Um, and of course, we know that there's been blackouts and things like that that have been partially uh, influenced by human error. So understanding the human element is a key part, I believe, in understanding current and future energy issues. We need to understand human behavior in order to address the large-scale challenges that are coming with us in the next several decades. So before I get into my project, let me tell you about two others that I think emphasize this kind of human behavior. So one is a tool that we're creating called uh, PV Value. This is by my colleague at Sandia, Jeff Kleiss. And I'm mentioning these two projects because I think they highlight some of the interesting aspects of human behavior. So when people purchase a house, they often need to understand the value of the house or when they're selling their house. This is done through an assessor, someone who comes in and values the house. Now when they see a PV panel, how do they actually value that PV panel in terms of the house? Because if it's not valued appropriately, lenders may not provide the appropriate amount of money. There might be more risk. They might perceive more risk. The lenders might perceive more risk. So we're developing a tool in which we can help assessors assess the actual value of PV on these households. Human behavior linked through a chain of uh, events to PV adoption. There's another project, we call it iGrid. Um, this is by my colleagues Lori Burnham and Christy Warnder. Um, and there we're actually looking at human operators in grid control rooms to see how as we change the tools that they have um, and as they get more data from, for instance, smart meters, how they react to these kinds of things and whether they can make mistakes and how to reduce those mistakes. So, and we're actually working with the University of Vermont, uh, sorry, Vermont Utilities to look at human operators um, and see what they can do. And I'm not going to go into details on these, but I'm happy to provide you more information if you want to email me uh, later on, and I'll have my email on later. So let's move on to the project that I really want to talk about today. Uh, we call it the Seed Sunshot Project. It's actually uh, funded through uh, the Department of Energy's Sunshot Program. And the goal of the SunShot program is to reduce the cost of installed solar energy systems to 0 0.06 per kilowatt hour by 2020. So this is to get the price down so low that people will think it's, uh, it's to grid parity, that it's as cheap to purchase solar panels as potentially to uh, hook up to the grid. So within that purview, they have been trying to reduce the costs on purchasing solar panels. Now, we also know that residential energy use is about 21% of consumption in the U.S. as of 2013. So residential, uh, reducing the use of residential electricity through PV, photovoltaic solar panels, which I will uh, call PV or solar panels uh, throughout the entire talk. They're synonyms for me here. So um, we want to try to cut down the cost of solar panels for residential uh, areas. Now, we know also the 67% of total residential system pricing 
for solar panels goes to soft costs. These are things like customer acquisition by the installer, the installation labor, and the supply chain costs. So the goal is, and customer acquisition is actually 10% um, there. So the goal is to reduce these costs, and in particular customer acquisition costs, um, so that we can reduce costs of PV. And the SunShot program has funded a variety of projects, one of which that uh, Professor Ray has. Uh, so there's, they're studying it from a wide variety of angles, uh, both uh, engineering-wise, reducing the, uh, creating the materials for PV, but also at the soft costs, reducing these uh, costs. And so this is where uh, our project comes in. Um, so a post that we had at the SunShot Summit. We, uh, Eugene and I uh, received this project about a year ago, uh, a year and a couple months ago. And uh, the main question that we want to address is how can we determine residential solar PV adoption tendencies and trends at the individual and the aggregate level? So how do we know uh, whether people will adopt, with, that is, purchase solar panels, um, at both the individual level and at the more county, state level. And our goal is to develop a model to test and identify incentive policy structures that can increase adoption. What we want to come out of this is some way of saying this type of incentive, that is providing money to purchase solar panels, is better than this type of incentive. We're going to test it out by looking at this model that we have. So um, how are we going to do that? Well, we're computer scientists, so we start from the data. We have adoption data. We know when people purchase uh, photovoltaic panels. We know how much they purchased it for. We know um, how big the PV system was and uh, when they actually talked with the installer, when they got money for their incentive. And as a bit of background, in a lot of states, in California in particular, which is where we're looking at, the state offers incentives, uh, subsidies, for you to purchase a solar panel. So depending on the size of the system that you purchase, you might get some money back. And that's a big part, that's a big issue to determine what those incentives are, how much they should be, and um, who should get them, and things like that. So here I've represented non-adopters as red squares and adopters as green squares. So we can look at this adoption data, but we can also think about all the different factors and variables that go into someone purchasing a solar panel. And there's many. There's technical aspects. Do we understand, does the household understand who uh, all the things about inverters, module types, you know, solar irradiance of the area? Do they understand the economic aspects, all the taxes that go into it, the financing structures, uh, Retirement issues when they retire, how that will, uh, how buying PV right now will influence that, aspects like that. There's also social aspects too. Uh, are there peer, is there peer pressure? There's social influence. Do they understand uh, whether other people in their area have purchased solar panels or not? And there's also cognitive aspects too. Political ideology, environmental ideology, attitudes toward climate change, attitudes toward energy efficiency products. All of these have an impact and all of these have been known to influence whether people purchase solar panels or not. So we thought, that's pretty complicated. So why don't we start by this? Why don't we use purely computational machine learning techniques to develop what's called a predictive model based just on the adoption data that we get? So in one part of our project, we're skipping over thinking about all the theories and social, cognitive, technical, economic aspects, and just focusing on learning from the data the different things that could make an impact, that could cause a person to adopt. Why is this interesting? It means that instead of assuming theories or trying to figure out how to fit them in, we can just see what the data says. And that has some benefit because the data might be saying one thing where the theories say another thing. So hopefully we can use the work in here along with models that actually test different types of theories. So as another part of a project, we're lo actually looking at experimental data. We're running experiments with humans that test out different aspects of these features. 
And then finally, we can combine them together. We can take the experimental data and the uh, predictive models based on the adoption data and put them together and make a better model than either one alone. So to answer, to kind of fill in the gap, we have our research question, we have our goal. Here's how we're doing it. We're going to develop agent-based models through data-driven machine learning. So there's four major steps here. There's data gathering, there's predictive modeling, creating the model. There's putting that model into an agent, putting that predictive model of individual adoption into an agent-based model. And then using that model to test different policies. And so I'm going to go over each of these steps in a little bit more detail. So before I keep uh, going to detail, let me mention a few of the team members on this project about which uh, these results, uh, who should take a lot of the credit for these results. So Sandia, uh, I'm at Sandia, and along with uh, Eugene at Vanderbilt. And we also have Ben Sigrin from NREL, um, as well as Eason Drury. Um, and uh, was Ben here, I believe? Yeah. Was Ben here, Ben Sigrin? Yeah. yeah. I see. Right, right. Um, we also have members from Wharton, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Howard Conruther, Arthur Van Bentham, Professor Ruben Lobel, and Dr. Dina Gourmet. Um, and from the Center for Sustainable Energy, Tim Treadwell, Georgina Mariola. And we're also partnering with Vote Solar, which is a community solar organization, Jesse Denver and Kevin Armstrong. Um, these organizations will come up as we, as we go through. Okay, so let's start by talking about what data we have, because we're going to be building models from the data, so let's get a better understanding of what data we have. So we have, in partnership with the Center for Sustainable Energy in California, adoption data from San Diego County. So we know who's adopted, when they've adopted, etc. We also have assessor data that tells us about household characteristics, you know, how big the house is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We also have electricity consumption data for adopters, so we know how much electricity they've used over, um, over the last 12 months. And we also have lease contracts for people who have actually leased their PV systems. We know uh, how much those cost. We've also done a survey, 1,234 PV adopters and 790 homeowners without PV. And we're running experimental, uh, two experiments, uh, the online experiments on framing, how you... Uh, how you talk about uh, PV, and also a field experiment where we're, talk we're working in a real live program uh, where a lot of companies are joining in to provide discounted solar panels, and we're actually setting up a framing experiment there where for some people we say that they're getting a discount and others say that they're not getting a discount. And we're going to test to see if telling people they're going to get a discount actually impacts whether they're going to purchase or investigate more solar panels. Um, today's talk is mainly going to focus on this data. So, as I said, a predictive model goes from the data to creating a model that is really the probability of adoption uh, for a household. So we're going to try to create these individual models that say that this household at this time has this probability of adopting uh, PV. You can also hopefully use this to identify important features, but I'm not going to focus on that. Now, we're going to take those individual models and put them into an agent-based model. So an agent-based model, and I'm going to be very loose in my definition here, an agent-based model is a model in which we represent entities, in this case households, as independent acting uh, entities. So each household in our model is going to make a decision at each point in time, independently of the other entities. It'll be influenced by them, but it will make its own decision. So those are called agents, the households, and that's why it's an agent-based model. So in our agent-based model, we'll have households that have adopted, these ones right over here, and households that haven't adopted, like these households right here. And we're going to embed them in a geography. We're going to actually put them in a map of San Diego County. Um, we are focused on the San Diego region. We have data from San Diego County, and that's where we're looking at here. So we actually know um, 
where the where the agents will be. So the actual predictive model that we create that I mentioned is going to go within each agent, and we're going to use that to simulate whether an agent is going to adopt PV or not. And we can also simulate uh, peer effects, uh, things like this person, the fact that this person has adopted, other people might see that that person has adopted and purchased a PV panel, so that might influence their decision. Now, you might ask why, why we would look at agent-based models. ABMs help because there is a very rich interaction between agents that we may not be able to represent except through simulation, modeling and simulation. We're going to be representing this peer interaction, agents interacting with each other. And the best way to do that, at least right now, is to simulate it. So we can simulate that situation. And that's why we're using agent-based models, to capture these kind of nonlinear interactions that can occur. OK. So once we have that model, and we'll test to make sure that it actually fits the data that we have to make sure it's kind of correct. Now we can test different things like incentive structures. We can give more money to individuals and see if that increases adoption. And here we're looking at a single zip code. This is uh, 92126 in San Diego County. Um, and we can test to see if giving more money, giving less money, actually increases or decreases adoption. We can do that without having to spend $200 million to go to San Diego County and give them money. We can test that out with the agent-based model. So it allows us to analyze policy interventions. So um, in addition to the agent-based modeling, the predictive modeling, which we're going to focus on, we also are going to be doing econo econometric analyses and things like that. Now, I'm going to talk in detail about the agent-based modeling, but I wanted to tell you a little bit more about some of the other results that we've had in this project, because I think they're interesting. Um, they're fun to talk about, too. So, so I'll talk a little bit about that before going into the details of the agent-based modeling effort. Um, uh, just to give you the, uh, the key insights, uh, a couple things we learned from the surveys. Retirement uh, spurs thoughts about adoption. Monthly bill savings is an important factor. It turns out that political affiliation, political ideology, can impact how you see messages uh, about, or how you interpret messages about solar panel adoption. We'll get into that, that's interesting. Also, it turns out that according to our models, for the economic aspects, stepwise incentive structures, like the California Solar Initiative structure, and I'll get into detail about what stepwise means, do not actually increase adoption as you increase the budget. That is kind of surprising. That means the more money you put in, it doesn't seem to increase adoption as much. Um, and I should say, do not increase adoption significantly. It's actually more useful to give away free systems in our model than it is to increase the budget to a stepwise incentive program. And that's surprising and could have impact for policies to depend on what uh, states will do next. So let me just tell you a little bit about the surveys and the experiments, and then we'll get into agent-based modeling. The surveys were done mainly by NREL and the Center for Sustainable Energy, Ben Sigrin, Easton Drury, Tim, and Georgina. So there's been a lot of surveys, um, several of which Varun has done. Uh, so we definitely have uh, seen a lot of that work. Um, um, and a lot of them focus on solar adopters. We wanted information about solar adopters and non-adopters as well. Because we want to try to figure out the differences between the two. So we, try, we did two surveys, and we tried to uh, have the questions that matched in both surveys. It's difficult, of course, but uh, we tried. So to give a brief overview, we asked a question, which events stimulated your thoughts on adoption? Why did you think about adoption? So this was just to the adopters. So clearly, this one is, uh, you know, what you would expect. Increased electricity rates, sticker shock. So you were thinking about PV as a way to reduce your electricity costs. This one is surprising. Turns out that a lot of people think about retirement. And then they think about purchasing PV systems. Because when you retire, it's better to have fixed costs. right? So this is something interesting and new. Uh, anecdotally, we had known that. 
We had thought, we had heard anecdotes about that in talking with installers. But here we've actually quantified you know, how big of an issue that is for survey respondents. We also looked at different um, aspects of peer uh, informational influence. So talking to neighbors, radio or TV ads, seeing neighbors, to see if you know, seeing neighbors who have PV can influence you. And they were surprisingly low, but it could be that this could be something that adopters don't realize that they were influenced by. That could very well be a issue here. One thing that um, is important, uh, there, was no, there seemed to be no significant differences in these uh, events that stimulated about adoption between leasers and buyer populations, uh, which uh, that's a current concern. There's a way of leasing solar PV systems, and we need to understand who leases and why they lease versus why they purchase. Um, we also looked at econ uh, economic metrics. What metrics did people use to think about solar? And here we also found something interesting. Adopters seem to think uh, less about monthly bill savings, that is the amount your monthly bill is reduced, than um, uh, host-owned adopters, people who actually own their own system, versus people who actually have a third party owning their system. Third party owners thought a lot about monthly bill savings. Non-adopters thought uh, reasonably well between that and payback period. So what we see is that monthly bill savings seems to be a very useful metric that people use. And this is important because often we think of payback period, the number of years it takes for you to pay back your system given the amount of savings that you're gonna get. So this means that when we talk about PV systems and we're trying to sell PV systems, we might want to think about a different way of framing the economic argument for purchasing PV systems. All right. Um, let me tell you about the online experiments. This is by Howard Conruther and Dina Gromet um, at Wharton. Okay, so this is a cool little experiment. So we uh, did it online. And what happened was that participants um, were recruited and they were given the choice of two different home improvement options to read about, landscaping or solar panels. All right. Now landscaping, the message that we gave to kind of induce them to go read landscaping was fixed. But the message that we gave for solar panels was different. And so we used four different messages and they're listed right here. So they, you can classify them as the message content and by the type. So with the energy uh, content and the type is reduced, the message that the subject received was want to reduce your use of fossil fuels. So we're reducing your use of fossil fuels, energy. The increased message is want to increase your use of renewable energy. So an idea that you're gonna increase something. And then in terms of monetary, do you want to spend less money on your energy use or do you want to save more money on your energy use? So we're changing how we're talking about solar, uh, solar panels. So what we want to do is look at how many people learn more about installing solar uh, panels and landscaping. And here's what we found. First of all, uh, so the x-axis are, are all the messages, energy and money, reduce, increase, reduce, increase. The y-axis y -axis is the percentage choosing to read more about solar. And the colored bars are the different political ideologies, liberal, moderate, or conservative. So first, let's get this out of the way. There doesn't seem to be any significant difference in terms of the monetary message. Uh, the percent who chose to read about solar didn't seem to change over uh, political ideology. But here you see an interesting difference. So if you look at the reduce energy message, which uh, whoops, was once again, want to reduce uh, your use of fossil fuels, 60% um, of liberals went on to read about solar, whereas only, um, oh, I don't know, 45-ish in terms of conservative went on to read about solar. This is a statistically significant difference. But when you change the message to an increased message of energy, it switched. The conservatives were the ones who went on to read about solar and liberals were not. So it turns out that liberals seem to respond more favorably to the reduced message for energy, whereas conservatives respond more favorably to the increased message. That's interesting. We don't know why yet that is true. That's something that we're gonna to try to figure out. Uh, but I thought it was a very interesting experiment to look at how political ideology can influence your behavior. 
and subtle too. I mean, these are slight changes in, the, in words. Uh, you can imagine making these changes on a whim as you're creating a marketing campaign, but you can see that it has an effect. It has a big effect. Uh, the question was how many liberals and how many conservatives. I'm not sure. Uh, I think in uh, the abstract that we submitted to Beck, they, it'll have all those details. And if you email me, I'll let you know. Okay. So I'm only giving you a little glimpse of these results because I think it's really interesting. Please email me, um, and we can talk more about it. Okay. So let's get on to the computational modeling aspects. Uh, so here, um, the main people who were working on this was uh, at Vanderbilt, Eugene and Haifeng, his grad student, and uh, at Sandia, Josh Letchford, a colleague of mine, and, uh, and me. So what do we want to do? We want to predict this adoption curve. This is the cumulative number of adopters in San Diego County by month from May 2007 to April 2013. So starting around zero, goes up to about 8,500. Uh, we want to try to predict that curve and then subsequently think about how it can go further on. So I mentioned a little bit of this data before. So the assessor data set, the household characteristics. Um, we have a set of lease contracts, which include the cost of lease. So these are actually the lease contracts. We have an NDA with the California Center, so we can actually get access to the lease contracts that people used. And Eugene went ahead and read through about 70 of them and extracted from there uh, the actual cost that people uh, uh, incurred. We also have electricity usage for adopters. Um, and we also have things like national unemployment rate, easy to get. Here's the important stuff, the CSI adopter data set. The California Solar Initiative was a program in California to provide incentives uh, for purchases of solar panels. Um, the last approximately through, from 2007 to 2013. Right now it's, uh, I believe, over except for commercial systems. Um, and from this data, we have adoption time, installation time, whether people leased or owned, and system size. What we want is to create a discrete time adoption model where each time what we want to do is figure out the probability that a household will adopt given some features uh, of that household. So uh, we want to do this at each month. There's the discrete time part. We're partitioning uh, time into months and say, OK, this month, does this person adopt or not? And we want features to represent characteristics of households. So if you can imagine a household represented by this PV panel, we want to create a feature vector for that household. That is a vector that has different information about the household, like the square feet, say, or the number of neighbors with solar panels, or the national unemployment rate, or the estimated yearly energy usage of that household. So we're going to create these feature vectors. And what we're going to say is that the classification of this feature vector is 1 or 0. 1 if they've adopted, or 0 if they haven't adopted. And we want to predict whether a household has adopted as a function of these features. And this is then a classification problem. You're given some vectors. They're divided into two groups. You want to figure out a function that can distinguish them. Um, and that's where we can, it's amenable to machine learning techniques and things like that. Now, we know that during this time, there was two major ways of purchasing solar panels. Purchasing, owning the solar panel, putting on your house, or leasing the solar panel. So you have a third party that actually owns the solar panel. And um, you have it on, and you pay them a fee. So we're creating separate models for purchasing leasing. And thus, the probability for a household to adopt is going to be the probability that they'll buy, the prob plus the probability of lease, minus the probability that they'll buy and lease, which is not going to happen. So that's uh, what we're trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out this model. Now, the features will not represent time explicitly. There's no feature in there that says that this is month five or something like that. So we need to account for when an adoption takes place as well. We want to know when a person will adopt, not just that they've adopted. Um, we also don't know the peer effects that are provided in the data. So the problem is that the adopter data is at a single time point. We know exactly when they've adopted, and we need to figure out uh, how uh, uh, we need to figure out how to use that later on. 
So how do we translate the data to account for time? Well, what we do is supposing that this is the data set and the green uh, squares are the adopters and the red are the non-adopters, what we're going to do is extend the data set backward in time. We're going to pretend like, look, this adopter, he adopted, or they adopted in September. In May, they might have made the decision not to adopt. They had the characteristic, they had the same house and things like that. They made the decision not to adopt. So we can simulate that this person didn't adopt then. And so what we're going to do is create for each household a data point with the appropriate classification, non-adopter or adopter. And we're going to use that to build our model. So then we can start to see when people adopt. Uh, so we're going to add two new features. You've seen all these household characteristics and electricity utilization. We're going to add two new features, net present value and peer effects. So net present value is uh, list the economic benefit to the household at a specific time to adopt solar. Simply put, it's the benefits minus the costs. So with owned systems, there's an upfront payment. With lease systems, there are lease systems there's upfront and monthly costs. So how do we calculate the net present value for all time points for adopters and non-adopters? Since the costs can change, incentives can change over time, we need to calculate that. For benefits, uh, we need to understand the monthly savings off an electricity bill. And we need to know the size of the system installed. We need to know the energy utilization. And that way, we can figure out the monthly savings. And it's not so simple because there's a tiered electricity rate. So, you know, if you use so many kilowatt hours of energy, uh, you actually, or electricity, you, um, you get a certain rate, and if you go over, you get actually um, a different rate. But we only know the size of systems installed for adopters, and we only know the energy utilization for adopters. So how do we apply it to the non-adopters? Similarly, for costs, we want to figure out the purchase cost for owners and the lease costs um, for leasers but we also only know the uh, costs for adopters at the time of adoption. And costs can change over time. So our solution, going from the data, is just to learn models. So we use a variety of regular, uh, uh, regression techniques, primarily L1 uh, regularized regression, lasso uh, regression. And we learn from the lease contracts and the CSI data and the assessor data the prediction of a lease cost. We also learn from the CSI data and the assessor data the system capacity. So we look at adopters and we say, OK, this is how much, based on household characteristics, this is how big of a system you need. So now we have a model for system capacity just based on household characteristics. We also look at ownership cost based on some of the same data. And then we also predict for each month the electricity utilization based on household characteristics. So once we have these models, and I'm not going into detail, but uh, we have a couple papers, and we're holding a symposium in November. If you want to come, uh, that'd be great. But also, we'll give you, uh, I can send you some papers if you send me an email with the details of what we did here. But now we can apply these models to the non-adopters and figure things out. We also include peer effects. So we include the geographic neighbors of an adopter or non-adopter. So we take two types of peer effects. It's kind of general radius of, uh, over an individual. So um, this is not the scale. We're not going over multiple zip codes. It goes up to eight miles in radius, or also zip code peer effect. So in each one of these things, we look at the number of people who have adopted within that area. So given that data, the assessor variables, the net present value, the peer effects, for each month, we can uh, learn, or taking all the months together, we can learn a model to predict whether people will purchase or lease a system, i.e., whether they will adopt or not. So we trained on 7 million data points, about 440,000 residents of San Diego County. We looked at the first 48 months, May 2007 to May 2011. We subsampled 30% of those. We did tenfold cross validation, and then we subsequently validated on April 2011 through April 2013. We assessed the fit using deviance ratios, and it seemed fine based on the null model. But more importantly, more interestingly, is to put it into an agent-based model and see how well it does. So let's do that. So we have this individual model of when people adopt or when they uh, lease. So let's take that and create this agent-based model. 
And we use the repast platform in Java along with the GIS package, the Geographical Information System package. And we figured out and simulated a single zip code. So at each month, we updated all agents, uh, all households, uh, based on their, the incentives that they can get at that household, the net present value, and the pure effects. And we calculated the probability of adoption for all non-adopters. Um, we also introduced the lag. When a person adopts, there's uh, you know between one to six months of time between when they actually get the system installed on their house. And so we simulated that here. What did we use to uh, check how accurate it was? I'm not going to go into the details of the equation, but the idea is whether the model predicts the data that we have, uh, how well it does. And we call that the likelihood, the likelihood of the, uh, of the model predicting the data. That's LDV uh, given P. So we're going to compare our model with a simpler baseline model, which is similar to ones that are in uh, Lobel and Paracas, um, that just use the net present value estimate and the zip code level adoption. So here it is on our validation data set for one zip code. And it's the likelihood ratio, the likelihood of our model over the likelihood of the baseline model. Greater than uh, one is good for our model. Less than one is bad for our model. And one, it means everything's even. So it turns out that we do quite a bit better over here. As we get later and later, it turns out that we do much better than the baseline model, which shows that we are actually doing reasonably well in predicting the data as compared to the baseline model. Uh, this is the average likelihood uh, ratio over 1,000 simulations, since it's stochastic. Um, I, think, I think we're going to hold for questions till the end. Um, right. So we also checked if uh, it actually predicted the number of adoptions correctly. Um, which we know from the likelihood, but this is a little bit more qualitative and we can understand a bit better. So here's actually the, uh, the adoption curve over the months. Um, so this is for the entire time period. So this was the training period, and this was actually what we used to validate. So each dot here is actually one simulation run uh, of the thousand that have been run, and it, uh, it's the number of adopters at the end of its time. So the actual adoption curve right here that goes through here runs right through what the model says. So that means that the model is actually predicting, it's running, and it's actually coming close to what the actual adoption curve was. OK. So the final thing that we want to do, we've got the model. Visual model, agent-based model. Let's check out some subsidies. And let's see how that works. So right now, there's a big, uh, there's a lot of programs that do what's called a stepwise subsidy program. So what they say is that let's install some overall amount of PV, which is measured in megawatts. And what we want to do is do that in steps. So initially, if people adopt at the beginning of the program, they get more money back. So uh, they get more money back. And if they adopt later in the program, they get less money back. An example of this is the California Solar Initiative. And here's their table. So they have 10 steps, and this is the megawatts. So as soon as the megawatts go over, that's installed over 100, then it actually, they switch rates. And for instance, these are the rates that people got. Megawatts, sorry. Um, so at each step, they get 250 per watt, all the way down to 20 cents per watt. So what we did was we simulated the CSI subsidy program on uh, using our agent-based model. And what we wanted to do was increase the budget of the CSI program. We wanted to give people more money than, uh, than what the CSI gave. And so the different lines here, the x-axis is the month, y-axis is the adoption. This is average over the 1,000 uh, runs. And we increased the rebate amount. So this is no subsidy. This is the CSI program. And this is double the CSI program, four times and eight times. What we found was that the number of adopters, while it increases, doesn't seem to increase significantly. So that's surprising. We're putting eight times as much money in, but we're not getting eight times as much effect. Not sure why that is yet. Um, we have some thoughts. Uh, 
So the predicted impact on these step, in these stepwise programs is quite limited, even at relatively high budgets. So what we did is let's test out all different types of budgets. Um, so we created this parametric budget space. I'm not going to go into details, but uh, we basically figured out, we listed out all the possible ways that you could achieve a certain megawatt uh, of installations over a certain number of steps. And we found the optimal one, the one that in, uh, included the most adopters. And here, uh, because I want to make sure there's time for questions, I'm just going to talk about the results. So here on the x-axis is the number of adopters. And these graphs are a probability, uh, they're density functions. So over the 1,000 runs that we run of the simulation, each of these colored curves represents uh, the distribution of adopters that were resulted over the, ten, uh, over the 1,000 runs. And the color represents whether we used one, two, or four times the budget. And each one is the best budget that we found within uh, our whole space. So even looking at that, when we look at all the possible budgets, increasing the budget did not seem to help. What you want is this curve to go way out here, because that means more adopters. Uh, the simulations predict more adopters. Once again, even looking outside of the CSI program, we get a, um, we don't see as much impact. Now, there could be multiple aspects to why this is true, uh, or why this occurs. There could be modeling issues. We are predicting uh, electricity usage. We might need to uh, get more data on non-adopter electricity uses, usage. Now, there's also a potential policy issue. Le in leasing systems, a solar installer will purchase the system, they'll get the incentive, and then they lease it to you. They might not actually give the incentive to you in the lease program. So that could be an issue here. OK. So let me quickly end. So suppose we uh, give away free solar systems instead of using the stepwise budget incentive pro uh, program. So instead, let's give away free systems and see if that will actually help. And so we have a trade-off here, right? If you give away free systems initially, at the beginning, a lot of people will see those systems, and they might get more influenced. And that will lower future costs, because as time goes on, systems get cheaper. Uh, if we give more systems away later, we can get more systems with the same amount of money, because the amount of uh, the price per system is, is lower. So what we did was we looked at, once again, a policy space where we looked at the fraction alpha of budget now versus the rest of the time, uh, and the rest of time t minus 1. So you invest a lot of money initially, and then you invest the rest of the money at the end of the time frame. So we varied that alpha, and we found the best alpha for different budget values. And what did we find? Something a lot better. Um, so as we increase the budget, going from orange to uh, purple, the distribution uh, in terms over the, over the simulations actually goes to the right. That means more adopters. So the, pro uh, the program is much more responsive to increased budgets um, than subsidies. Giving away the free system seems to help with that. Now, there's a lot of aspects of the CSI program, the California Solar Initiative program, that we're not capturing here. We're just capturing the initiative, the economic aspects. So, you know, there's lots of aspects like marketing and advocacy that have an impact, but we're just focused on the economic aspects. But within our simulation, given our agent-based model, this is what we found. And it could impact as we think about what type of policies for incentives that we structure. There's lots of future steps that we're interested in, um, trying to figure out the best budget. Um, we're right now just doing a sweep over the parameters. We could try to figure out a better way of finding that. Um, targeted mar marketing, other types of policies. Instead of just giving subsidies to anyone, maybe you want to target certain areas. Um, and more sophisticated individu individual agent modeling. Uh, we're actually looking at things like some product networks and um, uh, Markov networks to represent the distribution, uh, to represent households and other characteristics. Let me end with telling you about the Energy Market Prediction AAAI Fall Symposium in November. You should be there. It's going to be great. Uh, we'll talk all about this stuff in detail, you know, um, so, and we'll have papers uh, that describe this in more detail. If you can't come, give me an email, and I'll send you some of the papers, too. So thank you. 
Um, and please feel free to email me or Eugene uh, if you have any questions, concerns, thoughts, um, or more. Thank you. Do people find out about uh, about these subsidies before uh, on their own, or are they approached by someone? Because I'm wondering if they have to look into the solar system or solar panel already. That would probably be a reason not to get much of an influence if you were to increase it, because they've already looked in because they're interested. Right, um, right. So what's well, the timing? How does that work? Yeah, so that's a great question. So there's a lot of aspects here. We're assuming in our model that people know about the incentives and that they know exactly their net present value at each time. But in reality, obviously, there's a lot of marketing aspects. Right? People just may not be aware that there's an incentive program or solar panels. In the real world, it happens in a variety of ways. Installers can come, and they can actually try to target you with flyers, radio ads, print ads. You might see something on a, on a neighbor's roof and go and talk with them and actually uh, look at that. Um, and Brun, you've looked at this quite a bit in the, uh, in the Texas area. So there's ver several different ways that people actually can get information about solar panels. We're not making a commitment to any of those here. We're assuming that they have at some point, which may be too, uh, it may be too much of an assumption that we may want to change later on. It's just hard to find data on when people knew about something, right? Uh, you can look at marketing campaigns, say, and see where, it, uh, where they've predict, uh, where they've been done, but we don't really know. Yeah, sure. So when you build a predictive model like this, uh, what is the time frame you would be using this model? Uh, I mean, like how, lo how long is this model good for? Oh, okay. Um, so we trained the model, first of all, on like 48 months, and we tested on the validation period. Clearly, um, as long as the real world kind of maintains similar structure to what, uh, what we trained it on, the model could still be valid. But as the real world decreases in similarity, then you have problems. Right now, I think the solar market is so dynamic. There's a lot of stuff going on. So I think a model will have to be continually updated with newer and newer data. Uh, but when it settles, it might actually be uh, pretty steady for... I would hope at least like a year or two. Hi, um, just kind of a random question. Did you see any kind of correlation between months and seasons to adoption values? Yes, so we did add a season variable in there. That also affected electricity utilization, yeah. um, and clearly that has effect on net present value, which then could impact, uh, uh, could impact whether people purchase. Um, I don't think we found anything really big with seasons. So there wasn't like a season or like time of the year that more adoptions were made? So I think, uh, I think in the real world there were more adoptions during certain seasons, but we didn't really find too, we didn't look into that deeply. We added it as a variable, but it didn't show up uh, in too much as a, as a very highly predictive variable. So. Hi. Um, so uh, just making sure, but the CSI model, it was sort of an, an upfront subsidy for adoption of the panel? It was just so, sort of a one-time... Right, right. Okay. So they have two, technically. They have um, an upfront subsidy based on your system size and, yeah. and characteristics. And then they also have the performance-based type thing, well, for, where for the first five years, you get a certain amount of uh, money back for every kilowatt hour you, uh, you um, okay. do, uh, generate. Most residential systems, smaller systems, did the upfront uh, incentive. They got some amount of money per watt that they had built in. Because I guess my, my follow-up question was, I, I found it interesting that the leasers were more concerned with the monthly fee. So mm -hmm. do you feel that possibly like a monthly subsidy or 
you know, I guess would be, but I guess that was that was an option or a, like a mo monthly subsidy depending on kilowatts. Right, right. So the way I understand leasing contracts is that you lease from the uh, leaser and you get a cut off your energy bill per month. So uh, the leaser might get it through a upfront payment to them, the actual owner of the system, but they actually, it comes out to the, uh, uh, to the resident, the person who's actually using it as a monthly savings. So. Question Q. Um, so my question is related to the kind of you want to change the step stepwise CSI. So when you increase the budget, did you also get rid of the stepwise capacity goals, or you just change the, no. the rebate levels? Right. So what we did was, um, so we assumed that there was a uh, a goal for the megawatts, um, and at each step there was a sub goal. So you want to get to the step, and there was a rate for each step as well. And so obviously the rate times the step uh, times the goal um, has to be less than the budget um, over that thing. So we kept the uh, kept that there was a goal for each sub-step and that the rate changed per sub-step. Does that answer your question? This is great, Kiran. Thank you so much. My question is, can you talk about the trade-off between approaching this from a theory perspective versus a machine learning perspective? Right. So um, as I said, I think both are necessary. Uh, so what the data perspective provides is we can identify what is predictive from the data that we have. So in previous studies, for instance, where we looked at some data and we applied some different models, we found that one variable seemed to predict adoption uh, quite highly, and that was whether the house had a pool or not. Now, this is interesting. Uh, I wouldn't have thought of that initially, but it's something that came out of the data. And you can think now, looking back on it, why that could be. A pool could be linked that, to the fact that you might have more money or you might have more electricity costs. You can make post hoc some explanations for it. But a priori, you might not have thought about that. So data, learning just from the data, can help in finding those aspects. But the theory can help in understanding uh, the subtle effects that occur. So framing, for instance, is something that we're finding through these experimental studies that we may not see in the data. There just might be too much noise. There are too many other factors that, play, that come into play. So um, looking at these really low, small scale experiments can help, and understanding the theory behind it can help identify those factors. But when you focus solely on either case, you lose out on, obviously, the benefits of the other, right? Um, a model that's just based on theory, and I don't think anyone does this, uh, just based on theory will actually uh, fail to uh, account for all the potential factors that go into it, right? Um, there's uh, psychologists, um, and I'm a computer scientist, so I, I'm not a psychologist, but I read a little bit of psychology. and. The human, the human mind is still, we don't know a lot about it. We still don't know why people make a lot of decisions um, and for the reasons that they do. We're still struggling to figure that out. So solely based on the theory that we have right now may not be sufficient to explain all the behavior we have. So a combined approach is really the key. Um, and that's why we're trying to integrate experimental data into our data-driven modeling aspect. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So uh, go back to the, um, the net present value uh -huh. you mentioned. So uh, do we, uh, do you think the um, dep depre um, depreciation rate is also, also a factor? Yes. Given, given the time horizon of a solar project might be 15 or 20 years. Right, so. that's great. Yeah, the depreciation is an important factor. We haven't char uh, characterized that yet. And um, I mentioned it here. Um, I should have probably focused on it just a little bit more. But, you know, for leasing, it might be the, this accelerated depreciation that is making this uh, uh, is a much more important factor. And that could be why some of the CSI subsidies are not being, um, uh, not showing up in our model as uh, being uh, related to the budget. 
So I totally agree with you. We should incorporate depreciation into the model. We just haven't yet. Oh, just curious. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hello. Um, so I guess my first question is, what's the usual timeline for a BM like uh, development? Uh, the actual development mm -hmm. of it. Uh, so we've been doing this project for about a year. Okay. Oh, a year. Wow. Um, and also, so I know Sandy is developing the data and the model, or collecting the data, processing it, and the modeling. But um, is there any kind of division of Sandia that's kind of committed to fast tracking this information to, um, like, local? Um, or, or uh, state governments, or is it kind of based on state governments kind of seeking out that information um, from, from like Sandia or consultants like that? Sure. So for one, uh, we're actually partnered with lots of people who are actually doing the gathering of data. So the Center for Sustainable Energy ran the surveys along with NREL. So um, it's part of our project, but they actually ran the surveys. We're mainly focused on the computational aspect, drawing from our partners who have gathered a lot of this data. Now, we want to, you know, it'd be really nice to, for instance, give away the model and have people understand all this is public knowledge. The model will, is going to be published, and as, a, as an FFRDC, our work goes to the government for free. Um, so the model will be available there. But we have no plans for, you know, setting up a, uh, an outlet where people can just gather all this or contain all this data. The, the adopt, adoption data is private. That is about the adopters and how much they paid. And we have access to it because we're partner with the California Center um, and have the appropriate uh, legal framework to look at that data. Um, but these models, the experiments, all of that will be uh, published so online. 